A pair of 1-0 NFC teams square off in Atlanta on Sunday. Two teams who could be ascendant factors in the playoff race. Young teams who could be in the mix in the NFC for a long time to come. Aaron Freeman from Locked On Falcons joins me today for a crossover Thursday. Packers, Falcons, week two. Let's go. You are Locked On Packers. Daily Green Bay Packers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Packers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Peter Bukowski and I cover the Packers for The Leap. A newsletter I would love for you to subscribe to. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get podcasts. You will find Locked on Packers, the number one Packers podcast on the internet. And the show for fans who know what happened, they want to know why and how. Thanks to everyone who makes Locked on Packers their first listen every day. We hope you like starting your day with us as much as we like starting our day with you. Let's dive in on our Packers-Falcons crossover Thursday. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another crossover Thursday here on this illustrious Locked on Falcons podcast and Locked on Packers. And today's crossover Thursday episode is brought to you by Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. All you got to do is go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL or use the code in all lowercase, locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. So, guys, if you don't know me, I'm Aaron Freeman, your very humble host of Locked On Falcons, joined by Peter Bukowski, Locked On Packers host. And today we are previewing the week two matchup between the Atlanta Falcons and the Green Bay Packers. And if you want to continue to get great coverage on both of these teams, as well as this upcoming week two matchup, of course, make sure you subscribe and follow for free for both podcasts on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts so that you can get the latest episode as soon as it is available. So, Peter, my friend, how are you doing today? I'm good. I, I guess we got to keep working to be an illustrious podcast, though. It, it's okay. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to jump in here because this is, I, I think I've told you this before, but I when I first started at Locked On, um, I, I had to preview week two without having seen week one. And because I was going on my honeymoon and week two that year was um, Packers Falcons. And so this is sort of like a callback to me. So six years ago um, today, I was probably in Italy or something, but I had already previewed this. And I'm, I'm, I have to say, I'm much more happy to be here with you um, recording it in real time so we can actually talk about what's going to happen in the games. Normally, we talk about the biggest stories, right? Yeah. I, I have a question for you. I would like to flip it. I would like to know what you think from the outside is the biggest story right now in Green Bay. Well, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, my approach, if you were asking me what the biggest story in Atlanta, I think for both of these teams, like the biggest story for both of these teams is, do you have a quarterback, right? Yeah. And I think this year is about finding out if you have a quarterback. And I think Green Bay's as far as that goes, it went as about as well as you would like it to go with Jordan Love in his 2023 debut. Not so much for Desmond Ritter, maybe more on that a little bit later uh, in today's episode. So yeah. uh, to me, the biggest story is, hey, Jordan Love, you know, I, I, I was listening to Locked on Packers all week long in prep for this episode and I heard you talking about the good vibes going on in mm. Green Bay. Um, you know, I think the, the good vi the vibes are pretty good here in Atlanta as well, coming off their first win since, you know, they last played the Packers they got that was the last time they won their season opener playing the Packers in the first game in Mercedes-Benz Stadium back in 2017 oh yeah week two they won that game they kind of beat the brakes off of the Packers in that game sure did. I can say so myself and then what's also interesting about that is the next week they went on the road to face the Lions they won that game as well they go on the road next week to face the Lions so I'm just wondering kind of at least for as far as the biggest story here in Atlanta is you know can they keep their good vibes going but I think it's the same sort of conversation in Green Bay. It's interesting. Uh, the Desmond Ritter of it all did not occur to me because I, I guess after watching the tape, I just sort of assumed they're just like, Desmond Ritter's fine. He can he can push the buttons. They seem a little afraid to let him actually play quarterback. Um, 
And so we'll see how that moves forward. Uh, to me, the big story was the new look defense was six new starters, right? Um, the defense was what won them this game. I felt like this was a 10, seven game late in the third quarter against Carolina in week one. And, and you get the fumble Miles Sanders in, in plus territory to set up the field goal. And then you get the interception. Jesse Bates comes through with the play of the game to really uh, set up the, the touchdown, the go ahead touchdown with the lead that they would not relinquish. I'm, I'm fascinated to see how they react to this Packers team because I felt like the Panthers and, and I would love for your reaction to this take it, it, I felt like Carolina made it very easy on Atlanta in a lot of ways. Did not throw anything that weird at them. Atlanta seemed very content to just say, hey, Bryce Young, we dare you to beat us. We don't think you can. We're gonna, we're just going to let you, we're going to sit back and we're going to let you do what you have to do. And they, they stuck to those receivers. It's a very bad receiver room in Carolina, my goodness. And Bryce Young threw them the ball twice. And they turned the ball over once. And I did not feel like Frank Reich did anything to help Bryce Young. Matt LaFleur did the exact opposite. He did everything, especially in the second half, to help Jordan Love. And so I feel like I don't have a good handle on where this defense is because you played a rookie quarterback in week one. You play, you know, uh, uh, with all these new pieces, I think that it's impressive that that was cohesive. But I want to know, is this for real? Because I know the offense can be good. I know Arthur Smith is a, is a really good offensive coach. Tyler Algier and B. John Robinson – I guess it's Bijan Robinson. I'm going to have to get that through my head. I, I still call him Bijan, so it, I, it's fine. It's, it's fine. just it, like he even has the product with the Dijon. Like you can't you can't tease us with that and then have it say, no, no, it's Bijan. Well, it's not pronounced Dijon. I guess it is. Some people say, say Dijon. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's that to me, that's the biggest story. What do you think of that? Yeah, I think that's fair. I, and I, I think for this matchup, when we get into to key matchups, like to me, the biggest matchup is how do the Falcons play this Packers offense? Because mm. I think based off of week one, you know, you don't really feel great based off of where the Falcons offense looks where it's at. If it needs to get into a shootout, even though I think the Falcons have theoretically the, the pieces that they can, you know, throw the ball a bunch and, and, and get a bunch of yards and and win a shootout. Uh, with some of the weapons that they've had and invested, including uh, Bajan Robinson. Uh, but like, I don't think have they the found Falcons... Drake London since Sunday. Did they I ever find him? He's, he's still somewhere in, in the state of Georgia. We're, we're still trying to figure that out. But Fulton County, maybe somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> get him to Cobb County. Where, you know, <laughs> that'll be close enough. Um, maybe we'll get him to the stadium by Sunday if, if we can get him there. But um, <laughs> yeah, like, so I, I think this game is the defense is going to kind of have to win them again because I don't think the Falcons want to get in the shootout. I don't think that's the way that they want to play football. Um, and so I think, you know, that defense and how they kind of match up is, is going to be one of the interesting, you know, storylines for this game as well. What is your impression of Desmond Ritter through, what is it, five starts, six starts? I liked what I saw last year. I mean, it wasn't like incredible or anything, but it was promising for the first four starts if you're just basing it off of hey this is a guy's first four starts is understanding the offense executing the offense and you know there's all the components of a good quarterback right maybe not all the components of a great quarterback but a good quarterback that can win you games in this league and it's just to me this season it's like all those components just have to come together so that you can get that player consistently week in and week out and it didn't really come together in week one so it's like okay I guess we're just still waiting for that to happen. And hopefully it's this week, but we'll see. This is fascinating because I think both these teams are trying to make sense of how much of what their quarterback gives them is what their coach can give them, put it on his plate and what the, the pieces around him. I mean, Bajon Robinson nailed it, uh, is dynamic and they used him all over the formation. And I was, I was shocked how often he was like, a wingback and, or like it coming in motion and, and playing de facto receiver at times. Mm -hmm. um, I thought they did some really interesting things with him that way. We know Kyle Pitts is a matchup nightmare. If they would actually throw him the damn ball. Um, I don't know where Drake London is. And maybe it's just that Carolina was well-schooled enough. They tried a lot of those play action shot plays and Carolina was pretty well-schooled on all of them. The one that Ritter threw at the end of the game, not even open. He just said, F it, Kyle Pitts down there somewhere. And Kyle Pitts made a great play in between two defenders. So I, I just, I, the, the Packers and Falcons are in a very similar situation with their quarterback trying to figure out, okay, how much of this is just like, for example, Aaron Jones on fourth and three cooking TJ Edwards. Like Aaron Jones, it, if Sean Clifford is back there, you, you want Sean Clifford to make that throw, right? Like on, on the leak play to Sean or Luke Musgrave, he's wide ass open to borrow a JT O'Sullivanism. 
every quarterback in the league has to make that throw. The throwback screen to Aaron Jones. Every quarterback in the league has to make that throw. It's what is the rest of the game looking like for them. And this is another chance for both of these guys to prove it. And I think the matchups in this game are going to help dictate how these guys look. Yeah. And we will get into those matchups uh, as we continue. We'll probably talk a little bit more about Aaron Jones and hmm. whether or not he'll suit up this week, given yep. the hamstring. He was he was so good on that play that he pulled his hamstring, right? <laughs> he did the Bo Jackson right into the tunnel. Yeah. Yes. So we will get into all of those matchups as we continue uh, today's Locked on Falcons. And also Locked on Packers. I should remember that, right? It's Crossover Thursday. But, you know, it's Crossover Thursday. And I want to tell you about our friends over at Jace Medical, right? You know, in the world, Peter, things can throw us curveballs, right? Yeah. Uh, supply chain shortages, natural disasters, pandemics. You know, you might find yourself traveling and you might be in an unfamiliar place and you may not have access to the life-saving medications that you need and you need to be prepared more now than ever. And personally, I deal with sinus infections, ear infections. So, you know, I like to have antibiotics on hand if those things pop up from time to time. And Jace Medical has my back and they can have yours too. It's simple. All you got to do is go online, fill out a form. You'll get prescription life-saving medications sent right to your door. They have the Jace case where you can keep all the meds that they send you. It gives you the peace of mind that you need with the access to the medication in an emergency. And our listeners can save more than $360 by getting these life-saving medications and Incredible. antibiotics with Jace Medical plus an additional $20 off by using the code locked on at checkout at jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com promo code locked on. So continuing today's crossover Thursday with locked on Packers host, Peter Bukowski and myself, Aaron Freeman of locked on Falcons. We've kind of teased some of these key matchups, Peter, uh, but you know, I'll give you the floor as the away team. Um, what some of these key matchups that you're looking at to me, this is very similar for the Packers in, in week one. And that is you have to, you have to account for this running game for Atlanta. Everything we heard Matt LaFleur when he first got to green Bay say, we want, we want everything to be predicated on our run game. That's like half true for the Packers. It's actually true for the Falcons. Everything they do is predicated on this run game. And it is one of the most varied, diverse, and in your, in your MFing face, as Marshawn Lynch would say, uh, as, as any group in the league. And so the Packers have to be ready to play chin strap, big boy football in this game. Uh, and we saw it in week one. They, they played the, the bears defense or this bears offense rushing attack. Outside of Justin Fields scrambles, um, they held the, the Bears' actual running backs to less than three yards of carry. So they were up to the challenge in week one. I think it is a greater challenge in week two. Uh, uh, Paul Noonan, who writes for Acme Packing Company, joked that the, the Falcons are the indoor Bears. And that is true in, in a lot of just the way that they approach the game, the way that they want to want to live. And so stopping this run game, whether it's Tyler Algier, who's just like one of the most underrated players in the league. He, he was so fun last year, was was really good again. Two, two Tyler Algier plays changed the entire complexion of the game against Carolina, I felt like. And the Bajon play, come on, that play's dead. On the, on the little, I don't know if it's a true RPO, but on that little, the little slip screen, like Frankie Louvu has him dead to rights in the backfield, I think it was. And then he breaks two more tackles. You have, to, you have to be able to tackle in this game. That has been a problem for the Packers. I don't know, time immemorial, it feels like. Uh, and so they're going to have to be able to tackle on a fast track in Atlanta. That's going to make this really, really tough. And they may have to do without Quay Walker, who's in concussion protocol. He got lit up by a Bears offensive lineman at the goal line, returning that pick six. By the way, after he absolutely truck-sticked Roshan Johnson, who came in with his shoulder pads ready to lay the wood, and Quay said, mm, okay, cool, bye. And and scored in a very like Miles Jack at UCLA kind of way. If you remember when he was playing both ways there, they they need Quay Walker in this game. He started to take steps at the end of last year, and to me, he is one of those players that I think if he can play, he is a matchup player for John Robinson for Kyle Pitts underneath, um, and is someone who if he can flow well to the ball, his speed even when he's wrong. I think this is so key for linebackers in the modern NFL and. And the Falcons have some guys that can do this redirect and retrace. If you're wrong, he has that ability and you need that against a team like Atlanta. I I'm, I'm fascinated to see. I have to stop saying that. That's a tick for me. It's fascinated. Okay, cool. 
If I'm saying it, I hope you're interested in it. Uh, I got to cut it out. Um, the the way that Atlanta plays the Packers because how much of how much of Jordan Love can you really bank on? I don't know, and so I'm I'm fascinated to see from that part. I just did it again. Come on, Aaron, you gotta you got. I need a buzzer. I need, I need a say, shot caller. I always say it's it's interesting. Of course, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I Goodness, get you. I gotta stop. All right. Anyway, uh, please help me. Save me. Save me. I'm drowning. No, it's it's interesting. I did it. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> the Falcons mm. always are able to run the ball. It's been oh, so, so long interesting. Someone has stopped the Falcons from being able to run the football that I don't even talk about it on the podcast. It's like, oh, yeah, we know we're, they're going to run for 120, 150, 180, maybe yeah. even 200 yards every single week. That's that's what they're going to do. It's really the other things about the team that are the question marks. And one of the big question marks for me that we talked about as we opened this thing was how the Falcons are going to play Jordan Love. Mm. I thought the thing that stood out to me watching the week one game was anytime the Bears got the Packers into third and long, they just were content to sit back and play zone. And Matt LaFleur scheming up the plays and Jordan Love just was executing it perfectly, just carving up the Bears defense. He was yeah. money on pretty much every third down. There was like one time where I think the Bears played man defense and they, I think they got to stop, but they just never did it again. And so I think the Falcons with their new defensive coordinator, Ryan Nielsen, this is the fascinating and interesting part of this matchup for me <laughs> um, is, you know, we're still trying to figure out what his style is. And, but he's been preaching this attacking aggressive style of defense. But as you said, they were last week against Carolina, they were content to just kind of sit back. They played some man mm -hmm. coverage, but just, you know, we can lock down these Panthers receivers. Bryce Young's a young quarterback. We don't really need to do a whole lot to throw at him to disrupt this offense. I don't think you can play that style as the Bears proved against the Packers. They will carve you up. So I'm expecting we're going to play a lot more man coverage and we're going to hope that A.J. Terrell can lock down his side of the field. The question mark is the other side of the field, right? Jeff Akuda's back practicing after missing most of the summer with an ankle injury, but I'm skeptical if he's going to play this week. So if they're going to play that style, the weak link in that potential formula is Trey Flowers, who's been replacing Jeff Okuda. Flowers was fine in week one, but again, it was Carolina's receivers. Like there wasn't a challenge. I think it's going to be an even a bigger challenge. Even if Christian Watson is now on the field, I just think Romeo Dobbs and some of those other guys at Green Bay can throw at the Falcons defense are just better than what Carolina has. Yeah. Um, and then I just think the Falcons need to be more aggressive up front to try to disrupt and get pressure. That's one of the things that has stood out to me. You know, Bears barely got pressure in that game, but when they did, it did kind of throw curveballs into Jordan Love's face. We've seen in the past in limited sample size that when you can get pressure on Jordan Love and speed him up, he can, you know, the mechanics get a, maybe a little wonky and the accuracy right. can dip a little bit. So I expect the Falcons to play that sort of attacking aggressive, but because we don't 100% know if Brian Nielsen believes in that or is he <laughs> just going to sit back? I, you know, I think he does, but like that's how I would scheme it up. But that to me, if the Falcons can – do that and play that style. Maybe they can keep the points low enough for, that they're run heavy. We don't throw the ball to Drake London type of offense. <laughs> we'll score enough points to win this game. One thing that stood out to me as I was going back and watching the tape of um, the, the Carolina game was how involved Hayden Hurst was seven targets led the Carolina in targets had the touchdown, but it was just for five catches for 41 yards. So we're talking about underneath and a lot of it was just little middle of the field throws or sideline throws where that's what they're, that's what they were giving up. They were, I thought the best plays Carolina had was when they said, okay, we're going to clear everything out and just leak Hayden Hurst out. And the Packers have done that. They love to run four verts with a little chip release from the tight end. Um, and, and they did that in the pre in the preseason, a couple of times. I want to see how the Falcons play someone like Luke Musgrave who got loose against the bears a couple of different times. The other thing I just want to flag here. Ryan Nielsen was in New Orleans a couple of years ago when the Packers went down there without Devontae Adams, without Marquez Valdez-Scantling. It was Aaron Rodgers and Alan Lazard, and Alan Lazard had like 150 yards and a touchdown against a secondary that I think, frankly, is just flat out better than this Atlanta team. Now, that's Aaron Rodgers. It's different, but they had a lot of answers schematically to attack this style of defense if that's if they're going to play a similar style as, as that Saints team did, which, as you mentioned, you're playing a lot of that too high man coverage quarters. Like, let's let's disguise. I didn't see as much disguise, frankly, as I thought I would. I don't know if that was something that 
that they were doing more in preseason. If I, you know, I, I didn't watch Atlanta preseason coverage roles, if they were doing that or anything like that. But I expected to see from a Saints tree, Dennis Allen tree coach, I expected to see more coverage disguises. I think we're going to find out a lot about what the league thinks about Jordan Love in the next couple of weeks. Like, this is the start of it. Like, okay, you catch the Bears by surprise a little bit. The Bears are going to do what the Bears are going to do. You bring Ryan Nielsen in because he can be a little bit more amoeba-like and, and change week to week. That was one of the things that the Saints did so well. If we got to play two-man all game, we're going to do it. If we have to, if, we're gonna, if we need to blitz, we're going to do that. If we don't need to, we're not going to. And so I, I'm, I'm that part of it is something that I think will tell us a lot about where people feel Jordan Love is in his development at this point. What, what is your, I know you're, you're, you're interested to see, but what is your expectation? For Jordan Love? No, for, for the way that they're going to defend Jordan Love. I think, I think they're going to be aggressive. I think they're, mm-hmm. they're going to blitz a ton of that, but I do wonder a little bit, you know, does the game plan change a little bit if Troy Anderson, who's in the concussion co- protocol, yeah. is out? Of the lineup this week because you know we saw him blitz more than Caden Ellis. The whole reason they signed Caden Ellis was because he was so effective as a pass rusher. He didn't really do that last week. And so you would think ideally you put Troy Anderson against Aaron Jones so you don't get TJ Edwards, right? <laughs> you know, put an athlete on an athlete, mm-hmm. and then now you can use Caden Ellis to do the thing that you paid him for, which is get after the quarterback. But if Troy Anderson's out of the lineup. I don't know if you're doing that with Caden Ellis in coverage or Nate Landman, who's the next man up in coverage. But then maybe, then again, maybe you don't have to worry about Aaron Jones because he's dealing with that hamstring injury. So that's to me kind of an X factor in how that, but I would expect the Falcons to be aggressive in this game. Well, then that's what, what are the Packers going to do to counter punch? And, and that's something that we just don't know because we've never seen Jordan Love be in a situation where he's had to counter punch, which makes this to me must watch, not just for, for, uh, Packer fans and Falcons fans, but like I think these are two ascendant teams in the NFC potentially. If they can get these things right, if they've got the quarterback somewhat right, because there's a lot of young talent. And I think Arthur Smith and Matt Lafleur, two of the best young coaches in the league. People got to be paying attention to what's going on because I, I think these are two ascendant teams. We're going to talk about how this matchup ultimately plays out with a couple couple predictions here as we preview Week Two. Locked on Packers, locked on Falcons rolls on next. Today's episode brought to you by our friends at Prize Picks Crossover Thursday. Brought to you always by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is about as much fun as you can have during the football season, not watching your team. You test your skills. You can turn $10 into $250 with a few snaps, up to 25 times your money. And all you have to do, pick a couple players. Prize Picks does the work for you. They say Saquon Barkley, 60 yards. You decide if you think Saquon is going to produce more or less. Or you take Justin Jefferson, 100 yards receiving. You decide if you think he's going to take more or less. And you put those guys together. And you have yourself a lineup. It's daily fantasy sports made impossibly, impossibly easy. Price Picks has weekly promotions that can lead to even bigger payouts like Taco Tuesday. Each Tuesday, Price Picks discounts player projections up to 25% to provide even more value. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use the promo code locked on NFL, all caps, for a first deposit match up to $100. Repeat, it, this is your chance. I repeat, this is your chance. You can turn $10 into $250 if you do this right. Okay, prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use the promo code locked on NFL for that deposit match up to $100. So, guys, we are wrapping up today's crossover Thursday. Myself, Aaron Freeman, and Peter Bukowski. And um, Peter, you know, how how did the Packers win this game? Well, they they stopped the run. They they hold and, and I, stop. I think is a little relative, but I, I was a little surprised having watched the game that it was only you know the, the number of plays in that Panthers game. Like it did it did feel like. Um, more runs than they had, fewer passes than they had. I think mostly because almost every pass was like a screen play or a package play or like a designed, I'm just going to throw the ball here play. But stopping the run, both Algier and, and Bijan averaged over five yards a carry. Can't do that. Just flat out cannot do that. And, and if you stop the run, 
I think there are going to be opportunities in the passing game for the Packers. I think that this defense has to be tested more than it was. I think Matt LaFleur will make sure they do that. I, I go off into this, this this play. I think it was back in 2019. Was it 2019 when the when the Packers and the Falcons played on Monday night? Um, there was a there was a fourth and short. Packers have none of their receivers. Not Marquez Valdez Scantling, not Devontae Adams, not Alan Lazard. And they died. I think MBS was limited. They dialed up a fourth down call in plus territory to Malik Taylor. And he's wide open for a first down. They they can do this in terms of managing Aaron Jones, Christian Watson not being out there. They have to be able to stop Carolina. If they can do that, I think they can score enough points to win this game because I think Atlanta against this Packers defense, which I, I believe. Do you believe now? I believe in this Packers defense right now. I think that is going to be the key for the Packers. And I think I think this is like a, a 24, 24-20 kind of game. I think it could be 24-17. I like the Packers um, because I just I, I don't see enough from this Falcons passing game right now. Well, I can echo those sentiments. I, I don't see enough from this Falcons passing game. So <laughs> I locked on Falcons listeners are probably going to get tired of me saying this on pretty much probably every crossover, but the Falcons have to win along the line of scrimmage. They have to kind of control the line of scrimmage because they're just not a team at this point, maybe later this season, we'll be singing a different tune, but they're not a point at this team where they want to play this air it out type of football game. That was the old Falcons under Matt Ryan with Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley and those guys. But this team is, we want to punch you in the mouth. We want to be physical. We want to dominate the game on the ground on both sides of the ball. So I think that's the key for the Falcons. And if they do that on both sides of the ball, maybe they can keep this Packers passing attack from taking flight, as we said, and they can win sort of a low scoring game, right? Talk about, you know, important players in this game. To me, it's the Falcons offensive line. Right. Yeah. We saw the Falcons offensive line kind of get their butts kicked last week against Carolina. And Carolina really has two good players in their front. It's Brian Burns, Derek Brown. And you saw how good they are by basically those two guys single-handedly <laughs> kicking their butt. But Green Bay is stacked. Right? You know, I think Rashawn Gary's arguably better than Brian Burns. Right? Kenny Clark is very good. Probably we are, we are on the same side of that argument, Aaron, by the way. I, I think so too. Go ahead. You know. Falcon fans get upset because Grady Jarrett doesn't get enough national attention in some of their life. Kenny Clark's basically the same player yeah. as Grady Jarrett. Preston Smith is solid. Devontae Wyatt came off looking, you know, impressing the Georgia fans, being like, I told you so. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I like some of the rookies. I wasn't as high as Luke and Van Ness as other people were, but he looked pretty good in week one. Kobe Wooden looked good. Carl Brooks looked really good. Preston Smith, you got the Wiley veteran there. So they're stacked. They they got bodies. And so it's not just two guys that are going to wreak havoc. it on this game, it could be five or six guys that could wreak havoc. So the Can I give you an absolutely bonkers snap stat about the Packers front in week one? Go ahead. Eight players had two or more pressures. Yeah, They had 12 players with at least one. You only get to field 11, Aaron. <laughs> they had 12 guys get a pressure against the Bears. Eight with, with multiple. And they had, I think they had five guys with three or more. Lucas Van Ness had five. Devontae Wyatt had six. And the Packers, Matt LaFleur said this yesterday at his press conference. Rashawn Gary played 12 total snaps, okay? 10 pass rush snaps. The Packers charted seven pressures in 10 pass rush snaps. That is just like ungodly production. And, and he, look, he looked like that. He, he looked every bit. I was like, was his pass rush win rate 100%? It felt like that watching. Uh, and, and so Caleb McGarry, Jake Matthews, like, get ready because they can just keep bringing these guys in. And that's the biggest difference in this defense this year, Aaron, from last year and the years in the years prior. Joe Barry said this defense is going to look different. And a lot of Packer fans went, yeah, okay. And Kenny Clark said, watch the tape after week one. I'm not going to give away any game plans, but watch the tape. I watched the tape. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good. And that's why, you know, I, I went into the season thinking this was going to be a loss because I just thought the Packers were just a little bit better of a football team. And coming out of week one, I don't feel any compulsion to change that opinion at this mm -hmm. point in time. So I, I kind of need to see it first from the Falcons, especially coming off such a poor offensive line performance from them. Like, this is not a, a great time to have that, right? So I have the Packers winning this one like 27-20. I think the Falcons will keep it close. I think it will be like every Falcon game this year. It's going to come down in the fourth quarter, the final five minutes. Everybody's going to be sweating bullets. You know, <laughs> who's going to blow the lead? Who's going to, you know, win the, the game? That sort of thing. But I, I do have the Packers coming away. Isn't that exactly what happened in 2022? Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, cool. I'm glad we're on the same page. Uh, this is this is going to be really a fun game, I think. And it's two guys who, for people like you and I, who are just kind of sickos about about the game, this is like Christmas for us to just see all the different cool things that they're going to put together. Arthur Smith, Matt LaFleur, Ryan Nielsen, even Joe Barry, like some of the games and stunts that he put together last week were really, really fun and cool. And I, this is, this is one of those games. Like if you want to be the breakout team in the NFC, this is kind of the battle for the breakout team in the NFC, isn't it? Yeah, I agree. So let's see, let's have some fun and we'll all be here after the game next week to take you through all of it as locked on Packers and locked on Falcons rolls on. All right, thanks to Aaron for joining me on our crossover Thursday. Had an absolute blast. I have to chill out with the, it's going to be interesting, it's going to be fascinating. Find something more interesting or fascinating to say, Buko. Figure it out. I'll figure it out. Follow me on Twitter, Peter underscore Bukowski. Follow the podcast on Twitter, Locked on Packers. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe to the podcast, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you find podcasts, you'll find Locked on Packers. The number one Packers podcast on the internet. And if you want to come hang out with us after the game, like, oh my gosh, you guys, the biggest live show we've ever done was after week one, Packers Bears. After one of the biggest live shows we'd ever done. I think it was the biggest live show we'd ever done. We did two of them back to back in the preseason. You guys are loving the post game lives. We will be live post game Packers Falcons on our YouTube page. So you can stay locked on Packers.